Hello, my name is Sindos Barakat. I'm an R2 in anesthesia, and I'll be uh, talking about cerebral blood flow today during today's <clears throat> neuro rounds. Um, this is a summary page of uh, what I plan on discussing today. Uh, number one, I'll start with a uh, basic kind of uh, anatomy, um, uh, cerebral blood flow anatomy, and then I'll move on to blood flow regulators and uh, one of the larger topics, which is autoregulation, which does fit in within the scope of blood flow regulators in general. So I'm going to start with uh, the uh, circle of Willis. It's an anastomotic ring that feeds the brain with oxygenated blood. It's comprised of two internal carotid arteries and two vertebral arteries. The internal carotid arteries um, move through the skull base via the foramen lacerum into the, uh, the cavernous sinus via the carotid groove, and they join up with the uh, circle of Willis at the posterior communicating artery anterior communicating artery and they feed into the, uh, the middle cerebral artery. The other two vessels that are uh, comprise the circle of Willis are the vertebral arteries. They originate from the subclavian artery and converge to form the basal arteries at the pontomedullary junction and this gives off the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, multiple basal arteries, the superior cerebellar artery and the, uh, the posterior cere uh, cerebral artery, and they join at the circle of Willis with the uh, posterior communicating artery. The purpose of the circle of Willis is to allow for collateral circulation in the case of narrowing or obstruction so that the brain can uh, continue to be well perfused uh, in the event of alterations in blood flow. There, um, uh, are multiple variations in uh, the circle of Willis in general. Um, uh, we're commonly taught about having a full uh, loop, uh, an anastomotic ring uh, that comprises the circle of Willis. However, there's multiple variations wherein there are hypoplasias, narrowings, or lack of presence of some of these uh, arteries that feed into the, uh, the circle of Willis. Uh, some variations include hypoplasia of the anterior communicating artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the posterior uh, communicating artery, and the posterior cerebral artery. Most commonly, the posterior communicating artery is often reduced or not present. Um, the next uh, 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 point of discussion is venous drainage when it comes to um, cerebral uh, perfusion. The venous system has both deep and superficial veins and they drain into general venous sinuses. These uh, venous sinuses uh, are valveless and they exist between the dura mater and the uh, skull periosteum and uh, you get uh, continued drainage through these communicating venous sinuses until they uh, uh, finally end at the internal jugular veins. Uh, next, I'm going to touch on the spinal cord in general. The, sp uh, the uh, spinal cord uh, also has its own independent blood flow system um, and, uh, the, and it's comprised of an anterior spinal artery and this anterior spinal artery provides two-thirds of uh, the blood flow uh, to the spinal cord and then you have the posterior spinal arteries which supply the posterior uh, one-third of the spinal cord. The posteriors, there are two posterior spinal arteries uh, that provide that uh, posterior two-thirds of the spinal cord and there's one single anterior spinal artery that feeds those that anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. Um, with the anterior spinal artery, there are multiple contributors to the anterior spinal, uh, spinal cord blood flow and it's done by multiple radicular arteries that come off of the, um, <clears throat> of the aorta as it traverses through the abdomen. Uh, one of the most uh, well-known one uh, is the uh, artery of Adamkowitz. However, there are multiple other arteries that feed uh, the spinal cord. Um, so now I'm moving on to cerebral blood flow in general, aside from the anatomic aspect of things. Cerebral blood flow, um, average cerebral blood flow is about 50 ml per minute per 100 grams of brain tissue, which contributes to approximately 15 to 20 percent of cardiac output, um, which is approximately 750 ml per minute. 
There's variations in uh, blood flow uh, to different parts of the brain. Gray matter in general receives more blood flow than white matter. And this is often associated with metabolic rates, uh, with areas that are, have higher metabolic demands receiving more blood flow than areas that require uh, lower metabolic demand. Gray matter in and of itself has about 80 ml per minute per 100 grams of blood flow, and white matter has about 20 ml per minute uh, per 100 grams of uh, brain tissue for blood flow. There's additional variations I stated uh, in it, uh, prior uh, between areas of higher and lower metabolic air, uh, um, uh, areas within the brain. Low flow uh, states can result in neurologic dysfunction and uh, ultimately neurologic damage. Um, flow rates of um, 20 to 25 ml per minute per 100 grams of uh, brain tissue um, results in uh, cerebral impairment slash neurologic dysfunction. At 20 ml per minute per 100 grams, you ha yeah, have an isoelectric EEG, uh, not egg, sorry, rather EEG. <laughs> Um, and then um, for um, less than 100, uh, uh, 10, sorry, ml per minute per 100 grams, you get rever uh, irreversible neurologic damage. There are, there are multiple um, things that, uh, there are multiple factors that affect blood flow regulation in general. Uh, number uh, one is PaCO2. Uh, number two is PaO2 metabolic activity, temperature, cardiac output, slash uh, uh, mean uh, arterial pressures, uh, then autoregulation and anesthetic agents slash drugs, as well as sympathetic activity. And we're going to touch on some of those topics um, during the rest of this presentation. With respect to metabolic activity, cerebral blood flow is highly affected by cerebral metabolic uh, activity slash rate. The brain consumes about 20% of body oxygen, which is equal to about 2 to 4 ml per minute per 100 grams of O2. Um, um, blood flow and metabolic rate are highly connected, and this uh, phenomenon is known as coupling, i.e. based on the amount of metabolic, met of metabolic activity is the amount of blood flow that will be, uh, um, that will be uh, pushed towards uh, that uh, part of the brain. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, brain matter receives more blood flow than white matter based on this. And, the, uh, uh, and so a white matter receives less uh, because of less metabolic activity. Uh, the brain has no, uh, no energy reserve. Um, and so if uh, the brain is hypoperfused, um, then um, uh, we, uh, it will rapidly kind of uh, decompensate. Um, the main fuel source to the brain is glucose, um, and so cerebral metabolic rate is closely followed by glucose consumption. Um, high and low glucose states can affect neurologic function. Um, for example, hypoglycemia can cause neurologic injury, and we often see this with hypoglyce uh, hypoglycemic diabetics uh, with seizure activity and decreased LOC. Um, Autoregulation. Uh, the brain in and of itself can regulate how much blood flow it receives uh, and it does so through um, uh, arterial or constriction and dilation. Um, cerebral perfusion pressure is governed by um, mean arterial uh, pressure minus ICP or CVP depending on which is higher. Um, Often we're quite uh, we're more so concerned with ICP within the neurosurgery uh, realm. With increasing uh, arterial or pressure, uh, with sorry, with increasing um, systemic pressures, we have increasing arterial or constriction uh, in the brain, and then with decreasing um, uh, systemic pressures, we have increasing arterial or dilation in the brain. And you can see that here um, at the top with increasing constriction. Uh, at higher uh, systemic pressures and decreasing uh, and uh, increasing dilation at lower systemic pressures. Uh, with increase um, at the extremes, um, at the end, uh, at the extreme ends of arterial vasoconstriction dilation, um, uh, there are some uh, um, 
concerning changes. So at the extreme end of maximal constriction, blood flow is no longer uh, uh, able to be regulated due to this maximal constriction. And so blood pressure is, um, uh, sorry, cyst so uh, brain perf perfusion will be entirely affected by blood pressure. Um, and at the extreme end of maximal dilation, you have arteriolar collapse and brain hypoperfusion. Um, and with brain hypoperfusion, we can, all, we can commonly see that with hemorrhagic shock, um, agitation, altered level of consciousness uh, that we see in stage three to four shock. Autoregulation um, can uh, be affected by chronic physiologic uh, uh, states. Uh, for example, um, with respect to hypertension, you have this chronic uh, elevated blood pressures. And so the, uh, blood, uh, the cerebral blood vessels uh, are able to accommodate uh, uh, that to protect from brain injury. And so uh, cerebral blood, blood vessels become hypertrophied uh, so that they're able to regulate these higher perfusion pressures. That's important to keep in mind uh, intraoperatively, wherein you will have higher blood pressure regulation uh, uh, targets in these patients because um, uh, without, uh, without uh, factoring these into uh, your anesthetic um, uh, management, you can get brain hypoperfusion if you target lower to normal um, uh, pressure targets. Next, we have PaCO2. Um, and so between uh, PaCO2 of 20 to 80 millimeters mercury, there is a linear change between cerebral blood flow and vasodiameter. With um, uh, every one millimeter mercury increase in PaCO2, you'll get an increase in one ml per 100 uh, grams of cerebral blood flow. Um, by decreasing uh, PaCO2, you get decreasing cerebral blood flow. With increasing PaCO2, you get increased cerebral blood flow. We use this intraoperatively to help uh, manage uh, intra, um, uh, increased ICP. And so we often hypoventilate patients to be able to decrease their, um, uh, to increase their cerebral um, uh, vessel constriction to allow for a, a reduction in ICP. Um, hypoventilating patients can uh, result in uh, um, um, uh, vasoconstriction uh, and decreased IFCP for about six to eight hours um, at, uh, at, uh, after a prolonged duration of, hyper, uh, uh, of hyperventilation. Um, the cerebral CSF can uh, then reset um, its buffer and increase bicarbonate levels, uh, resulting in the lost, uh, lost ability to maintain uh, that cerebral um, uh, vasoconstriction and decreased ICP. Extreme hyperventilation can cause cerebral ischemia due to significant va cerebral vasoconstriction. Intraoperatively, we often aim for a PaCO2 uh, of about 28 millimeters mercury. And you can see on the graph that linear relationship between, um, uh, between PaCO2 and uh, cerebral blood flow right here in blue. With respect to PaO2, PaO2 has very little effect on cerebral blood perfusion in general, unless um, there's a significant hypoxia. Uh, with um, with uh, uh, PaO2s of 50 millimeters mercury uh, or less, you have significantly increased cerebral blood flow. There's no effect on cerebral blood flow when it comes to higher um, PaO2 levels. Um, um, so whether or not you're normal, normal oxic or hyperoxic, there's no effect in cerebral blood flow. Mm -hmm. And that can be seen on this curve via the uh, purple um, curve, um, uh, purple line on this, uh, this curve. So over here, you can see increased cerebral blood flow at uh, PaO2 of less than 50 with um, uh, plateaus uh, thereafter. After.
Temperature also affects um, cerebral blood flow because temperature in and of itself decreases the basal metabolic rate and as a result decreasing metabolic rate um, uh, also decreases uh, cerebral uh, um, blood flow requirements. Um, cerebral blood flow uh, increases with increasing temperature and decreases with decreasing temperature. And cerebral blood flow increases by approximately five to seven percent per one degree Celsius increase from normal te uh, uh, normal uh, temperature, and uh, decreases by about five to seven percent with uh, uh, reduced uh, with one degree reduced temperature. At 27 degrees Celsius, cerebral blood flow is decreased to approximately 50 percent. And at 20 degrees Celsius, EEG readings are isoelectric. Hyperthermia, as we know, can cause uh, neur uh, uh, neuronal injury um, as well at temperatures higher than 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, what we do every day can affect uh, patients' uh, blood flow. Uh, anesthetic agents in and, of, in and of themselves can affect uh, blood flow. Um, Anesthetic agents have been implicated in a phenomenon known as cerebral blood flow uncoupling. And this is a dose dependent, um, this is dose dependent and certain anesthetic agents cause higher levels of uncoupling than, uh, than other anesthetic agents. Um, and it's for these reasons that our anesthetic cho choices have to be tailored based on patient symptomatology uh, with respect to symptoms of increased IFCP. Aside from affecting cerebral blood flow, anesthetic agents also affect CSF production and absorption. All anesthetic inhalational agents increase cerebral blood flow and decrease cerebral metabolic rates. As you can see on this graph, there's a very clear dose dependent effect too. Uh, cerebral blood flow based on um, uh, level of MAC with respect to the, this is normal curve of cerebral perfusion, um, um, perfusion and cerebral blood flow. With increasing MAC, as you can see, you lose that uh, relationship um, uh, between cerebral blood flow um, and uh, uh, cerebral uh, uh, sorry, as you can see on this graph, the body's ability to adjust cerebral blood flow based on systemic pressures is lost with increasing MAC requirements. This is a uh, well summarized graph um, uh, discussing uh, cerebral uh, um, uh, uh, metabolic rate, blood flow, CSF production, as well as ICP and cerebral blood volume based on the anesthetic choice um, made. Um, I have a, a, a citation at the end of my um, of uh, my presentation from where this graph was uh, uh, obtained from. Um, as mentioned previously, all anesthetic inhalational agents increase cerebral blood flow and decrease cerebral metabolic rates. Um, Sevoflurane has the lowest effect uh, on increased cerebral blood flow and is often preferred intraoperatively if uh, inhalational agent needs to be used. Isoflurane has the greatest effect on decreasing cere uh, cerebral metabolic rate. Halothane, which is seldomly used uh, in the first world, uh, is the worst uh, when it comes to uh, lowering um, um, uh, uh, ICP or affecting ICP rather. Um, it, reduce, it has the least effect on reducing cerebral metabolic rate and has uh, the highest effect in increasing cerebral blood flow. So now moving on to IV anesthetic agents. All IV anesthetic agents decrease cerebral metabolic rate and cerebral blood flow, and they, uh, therefore they maintain coupling. Um, and they are able to maintain the relationship of PaCO2 uh, to cerebral blood flow. 
Purple Fall does a fantastic job of um, decreasing, decreasing cerebral metabolic rate um, and cerebral blood flow. The exception to um, my uh, statement on uh, uh, cerebral metabolic rate and blood flow with respect to IV anesthetic agents is ketamine. Ketamine is the only agent that increases cerebral blood flow um, and so has the potential to increase ICP. However, with respect to clinical relevance, uh, when using um, ketamine in conjunction with propofol, it doesn't really seem to increase cerebral blood flow significantly. Opioids um, uh, generally uh, do, not uh, do not affect cerebral metabolic rates or cerebral blood perfusion, and so ICP is unchanged. Unless patient is hypoventilating and acidotic, uh, do, um, may you potentially get um, uh, increased uh, uh, cerebral blood flow due to carbon dioxide retention. But otherwise, um, on its own with uh, normal uh, uh, ventilation, uh, opioids do not uh, change uh, cerebral metabolic rate or cerebral blood perfusion. Um, uh, succinylcholine can uh, minorly increase ICP due to fasciculations. If a cough is compared to 50 millimeters mercury of increased ICP, uh, succinylcholine um, can increase uh, ICP by about 15 millimeters mercury. Um, and in general, uh, when you're intubating these types of patients, it's important to make sure that they are appropriately uh, relaxed and are uh, in stage three anesthesia without airway reflexes um, to appropriately uh, uh, intubate patients without fear or concerns about increasing uh, uh, ICP in general due to synthetic simulation. No, uh, non-depolarizing muscular blockers do not affect uh, uh, cerebral metabolic rate or blood perfusion. Here's a, another summary slide discussing that exactly. Thank you for listening to uh, my presentation. Uh, the charts and, uh, uh, that I received were from Dr. Rebel's uh, talk from the University of Kentucky, and uh, other um, uh, slide notes were received from Barash. Thank you very much.